Are you attending GSA sessions as well, or is it other than meeting with Wiley? Tammy? Yeah, I, yeah, I have. Um, I've given a, a poster um, about the water quality in India on the Ganges River. Oh, um, okay. And uh, I have a paper that's under uh, second review for um, sustainable water resource management. So that should come out any time now. And um, I have um, expanded uh, my Iceland geology tours into a bigger company. So it's now called Adventure Geology Tours. And we'll have a booth. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, you have a lot going on at GSA. Yeah. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Moving and shaking. Good for you. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Grass doesn't grow underneath my feet. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Nor would I want it to. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome everyone today to uh, the AIPG webinar that we'll be hosting. Uh, that's going to take a take us on an adventure in Iceland. I'd like to introduce Dr. Tammy Giovanelli. Uh, Dr. Giovanelli is associate professor of geology at Berry College down in Georgia. So, if you happen to be in that neck of the woods, you're uh, probably familiar with Berry College. If you're not, it's a fantastic uh, liberal arts college with a wonderful reputation. We're really glad to have Dr. Giovanelli today. Uh, she is the author of a book titled Iceland, Tectonics, Volcanics, and Glacial Features that was published by John Wiley. And that was one of Wiley's very best-selling books of 2020. So obviously- And 21. Uh, 21. Obviously, Dr. Giovanelli uh, uh, knows her way around Iceland. Uh, with that, I will turn it over and let Dr. Giovanelli take us on a trip. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So again, my name is Dr. Tammy Giovanelli. I'm an associate professor of geology at Berry College. We're in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, and um, it's just starting to be fall here. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful fall day. Um, uh, as Aaron mentioned, I'm the author of uh, an advanced geological concepts book about Iceland, and that book is separated into three major parts, focusing on tectonics, volcanics, and glacial features, and it's very much how this lecture will be organized for you this afternoon. Um, but before we get into it, most people are interested as to how I got um, interested in Iceland in the first place. So my first trip to Iceland was in 2006. Truly when the island was off of the, the marker for most tourists. I invited my big brother, Jim, to tag along with me. And in the course of about 11 days, we toured the island in a Toyota Yaris. Not the, the best choice. Um, and we quickly traveled the island in about 11 days around something that's called the Ring Road or the Golden Circle Road. And in 2006, this was before GPS technology. And so we were using a series of these clumsy paper road maps. We found out that in June in Iceland, there's 22 hours of daylight. So we couldn't really navigate by the sun and there weren't many road signs. So we found ourselves perpetually lost but we were perpetually lost in this beautiful and pristine landscape that would bring me back nearly every single year thereafter. In 2014, I acquired a wonderful husband who has an amazing sense of direction, and we began to explore even the most remote parts of the interior of the island through backpacking and hiking. And this was really a game changer for me because it allowed me to synthesize the geology of the island in its entirety. I initially went to Iceland in uh, 2006 to set up a study abroad program for undergraduate students at, at Barry College. And in doing this for more than a decade, I looked down in 2017 and realized I probably had enough information to write a book. And so I did. And I love the writing process so much that I have started um, to write my second book about the advanced geological concepts of, of Costa Rica. So, so look for that on the shelves to be coming next. Before we move any further, there's something else that you should know, and that is. That is, I don't speak Icelandic. Uh, as you heard, thank you, Google. It's a pretty complicated Nordic language. And although I practice with really good intention, 
I never quite nail it. So I apologize in advance for my mispronunciations. And additionally, because this is a talk on geology, there's some acronyms that you need to become aware of. And that is millions of years old, millions of years ago, modern time will be referred to as the common era and historic time will be referred to as before common era. And on many of my diagrams, you're gonna see this yellow symbol, that's a, a star, and that's gonna represent a hot spot or a mantle plume. And we're gonna see how that mantle plume is gonna be a driver for a lot of the geology that we see on the island. So we will begin our talk about the geologic wonders of this amazing place. To start, we are going to take a look at this plate tectonic diagram. Oh, we're gonna take a look at the modern day plate tectonic diagram. We'll locate ourselves on the North American plate, which is in purple. And to the right of the North American plate, you'll find the Eurasian plate in orange. And what separates the North American plate from the Eurasian plate is a divergent plate boundary. So a boundary that is pulling apart, spreading or rifting apart from one another. And conveniently located on top of that divergent plate boundary is the island of Iceland. Iceland is sitting at approximately 66 degrees north. It is approximately 38 miles south of the Arctic Circle. And it is bordered by the cold uh, Arctic waters uh, to its north and the cold, dense, and very saline waters of the North Atlantic to its south. The geologic history of Iceland is pretty unique, especially if we consider the age of the Earth to be 4.6 billion years old. Iceland is the result of the last Pangaea cycle, starting to form only 50 million years ago. So at 50 million years ago, there is a hot spot that begins to form with uh, hot magma coming up from the outer core and resting below the surface. And on the diagram to the right, you can notice the location of where that hot spot was approximately 50 million years ago underneath Greenland. And we can trace it from 50 million years all the way up to modern day, modern day represented by zero on this diagram. Remembering that the mantle plume is stationary and instead what's happening is that the plates are moving over top of it. So essentially we're seeing the trail of where that hotspot was from 50 million years to present day. So at present day, the hotspot that's approximately 200 miles in diameter is under the island of Iceland. Also on this diagram highlighted in red, you'll notice the divergent plate boundary. You'll notice that the Eurasian plate is to the right and the North American plate is to the left. The story becomes interesting at approximately 33 million years ago, where that mantle plume was close enough to the oceanic crust that it began to breach. And so at 33 million years ago, we begin to form the foundation of the island of Iceland called the Icelandic basaltic plateau, where you get piles upon piles of this basaltic magma that's coming to the top of the oceanic sea floor. So, um, at modern day, when we, um, we look at the island of Iceland, we only see about 30% of the plateau. The remaining 70% is submerged be below water. So when we orientate ourselves on this mat to that hot spot, you'll notice that the divergent plate boundary is highlighted in pink. And there's two parallel red bands that I'll call your attention to. And that indicates rocks that are only 2 million years old. So the story should start to make sense, right? So when you have spreading or rifting along that divergent plate boundary, you start to make a conduit for magma to more easily come up to the Earth's surface. So the younger rocks are gonna be closer to that divergent plate boundary, and they're gonna get consecutively older to the east and to the west. So when you look at the yellow parallel bands, you'll notice that those rocks are about 10 million years old. So if you have the great fortune to go to the eastern city called Aglisador or all the way to the western fjords, the oldest rocks you're going to see are only 13 million years old. So in terms of geologic, it has barely had a birthday.
So the mantle plume is a dynamic system. It is not static. And within that mantle plume, oh, I'm frozen. Within that mantle plume, there is a density driven system that's called convection cells. So you're imagining warm magma coming up to the surface and then eventually it will cool and condense. So you end up with these circulatory cells within the mantle plume. And it is those circulatory cells that will prove to be a driver of the divergent plate boundary and help to exacerbate the, the movement that we see on the island of Iceland. So when we look at the modern day divergence, we see that it is spreading or rifting at one inch per year or 13 miles per million years. I'm gonna repeat that because there's a quiz at the end. The spreading on Iceland is happening at one inch per year or 13 miles per million years. So if you're interested in buying property on the island of Iceland, you should buy it along that divergent plate boundary because your property size is only getting bigger. <laughs> you might have to deal with earthquakes, but there's insurance for that. So if you've made it to the capital city of Reykjavik, I hope that you have made it a two hour trek to the east to one of Iceland's only national parks. So highlighted with a, a yellow star on the diagram to the right is the location of Thingvellir National Park. Uh, Thingvellir National Park is known to be the home of the Vikings who established themselves in 874 CE and began to hold their parliamentary services in this location. And you might ask, well, why do they choose Thingvellir? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, away from the coastline, so the weather is a bit less harsh. And there's a beautiful lake that sits in a graben that's called Lake Thingvellir. But to a geologist, this national park is even more exciting because this is one of the only places in the world where you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge exposed at the surface, where you can truly get a handle on what this divergence and spreading actually looks like. So when you're in the national park, you're standing on top of the Eurasian plate. You're looking 13 miles across that basin to the North American plate. So anytime that you have rifting, you have subsidence occurring in the center. You might remember the terms horst and graben, where your upper elevations are the horst and your, your basin is the graben. So as these plates continue to spread or rift apart, you continue to have subsidence in the basin and infilling with, with water. So Lake Thin Valera continues to get deeper at about one inch per year. Um, on this diagram uh, to the left, where you see the picture of Thing Valer, um, you'll notice that the distance between those two plates is 13 miles. And what we said was the spreading happens at one inch per year or 13 miles per million years. So we can even age date the spreading that has happened in this specific location of Iceland. Um, within Thing Valer National Park, there's about 10 miles of hiking trails. One of my favorite is called Amaja. And um, I love this trail so much because you get great examples of, of normal faulting that occur. So you remember that when you have divergence, you have tensional normal faulting and you can see slumping and blocks that have um, occurred, uh, occurred very recent in and around this trail. So in addition to being able to see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge up close and personal, another great thing about Iceland is that there's a lot of volcanic activity. So some of you are probably heading to trivia here tonight. Here's your fun fact that you're gonna take with you. Iceland, that's about the size of Virginia, has 33 active volcanoes. What, can you imagine? Iceland, that's about the size of Virginia, has 33 active volcanoes. So pretty much anywhere you look at the landscape, you're either going to see an active volcano, a dormant volcano, or some type of volcanic feature. I'll draw your attention to the map here on the right. We've located our hot spot in yellow, and those 33 active volcanoes are numbered. So they're numbered one through 33. So take a second to look at this diagram and hopefully a pattern will begin to emerge. 
And so what you would tell me is that Dr. Joe, those volcanoes outline the divergent plate boundary. And that makes sense, right? Because we said you have rifting, you have a conduit, you have magma more easily coming to the Earth's surface. So you can see that the presence of that divergent plate boundary outlined by those 33 active volcanoes. When we talk about volcanoes in Iceland, we separate them into three main categories. We talk about the Northern volcanic zone, the Eastern volcanic zone, and the Western volcanic zone. On Iceland, and arguably in the world, we would say that the biggest and baddest volcanoes are in the Eastern volcanic zone. So those volcanoes that are along the Southern coastline, um, meeting the, the North Atlantic Ocean are some of the most catastrophic and have the most energy of any of those that we have seen in and around the globe. I'm gonna talk about a couple that are my favorite. So I'll call your attention on this map to numbers 14, 15, 16, and 18. So these volcanoes in the Eastern volcanic zone are going to prove to wreak some havoc on the planet. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna to talk to you about um, some of my favorite volcanic features. One of the reasons vol volcanologists um, go to Iceland is because there's um, a variety of different types of volcanism and there's a variety of different type of volcanic features. So you can pretty much see everything in one location that's about the size of Virginia. Um, the first feature, is called a rootless cone. And uh, a rootless cone is also called a pseudo crater. And while it has um, some relief that makes it look like a volcano, it forms very differently. So instead of having a, a subsurface uh, uh, vent or magma chamber, how these form is it, they occur when lava is flowing at the earth's surface. And that lava comes into contact with water. And that water might be a lake, it might be a river, it might be permafrost. But when that lava comes into contact with water, you get a one-time steam eruption. And that steam eruption can drastically alter the surface of the earth as evidenced by this picture. So this was taken in a location that was called um, Mivatn. Mivatn is a, a city that's up in the, the northern part of Iceland. Usually when we talk about um, rootless cones, um, we talk about them being in a complex. So you don't usually don't find one, you usually find many in an area. Otherwise they would be called probably like a mar. Um, so in this location in Mivatn, there's 21 of these different craters. And if you look at them aerially, you can tell the direction of which the lava was flowing. There is a location um, in the Southern part of Iceland um, that's called Ruholer, and there's 81 of these different craters. And they range in size and height and depth, um, but it truly kind of gives you the feeling like you're on the moon when you explore these crater fields. The next feature I want to introduce you to is called columnar basalt. And in this situation, magma is coming up from the subsurface, but in this case, it is being trapped usually by glacial ice, but it could be by water. So as your magma is coming up from the subsurface and it's coming in contact with either the water or the ice, um, the igneous rock that's called basalt begins to get quenched. And as it gets quenched, its cooling rate quickens and it becomes solidified and contracts. And so it's growing up from the bottom and as it does, when it's cooling, it's growing these long and beautiful columns. And when you look down on top of these columns, there's this perfect like hexagonal pattern. Um, this is a picture from a location that's called Vic. Uh, it's also called the Black Beach in the south of, of Iceland. But you can see examples of column basalt pretty much anywhere on the island. And it gives you an indicator of its cooling process and the involvement of water. And they can also range in, in um, size and in width. And the feature probably um, of most interest to, to me um, as I am interested in uh, climate change and understanding how um, sea level has changed over time um, is a feature that's called a pillow basalt. 
Um, you might have uh, witnessed these if you've been following any of the modern day Hawaiian Island eruptions. Uh, these form when you have lava that's flowing down the surface of a volcano and that lava meets the ocean. And so opposite of uh, the, the columnar basalt where you had contraction, in this situation you have expansion or inflation. And so that's how you end up with these beautiful pillow-like structures. So if you're riding around the, the Golden Circle Road and you're looking for these pillow basalts, they can give you an indicator of where the paleo or ancient coastline used to be. And of course you have to account for erosion and uh, uplift and isostatic rebound and those types of things, but it gives you a very good starting point. <laughs> and because of this volcanic activity over geologic time, Iceland has had some pretty impressive volcanic eruptions. So um, when we look for uh, volcanic activity, activity historically on the island of Iceland, uh, we use a science that's called tephrochronology. So tephrochronology is really looking and mapping the amount of volcanic ash from different volcanic events. Because as we know, what goes up must come down. And so that volcanic ash as it lands on the surface will be incorporated into the geologic record. Um, each uh, volcano will have a different mineralogy and even within a different, within each volcano, each volcanic event will have a slightly different fingerprint. So it's very easy to, to trace them um, on the island of Iceland, but also all the way um, to Europe in the case of an Ascia event that happened in 1856. So when we look at that tephrochronology record, what we find is that 80% of the eruptions on the island of Iceland have taken place in the Eastern volcanic zone. Um, additionally, when we look at the mineralogy of those events, we say that 78% of them were explosive eruptions. So the intensity of the explosion deals with the mineralogy. So we looked to make a comparison between, um, between the ash that is felsic, which means it's high in silica, to that that is mafic, that is low in, low in silica. So explosive eruptions are kind of like your classic CNN volcanoes that they show on TV with this massive ash cloud going up into the atmosphere that's gray, felsic, light in color, high in silica content. Opposite of that is a non-explosive eruption. Your classic is the Hawaiian Islands. It's mafic, it's black in color. It doesn't have a, a, a high ash cloud going into the atmosphere. So Eastern volcanic zone um, are mostly explosive eruptions. If you're on Iceland, on the island, and you get a chance to talk to a local, and let's say that local is 100 years old, they're gonna have lived through between 20 and 25 different volcanic eruptions. So every century, there's about 20 to 25 different volcanic eruptions uh, that have happened. Um, I was lucky enough this past summer to have been able to witness um, the, the uh, fissure eruption that just happened on the Radies Peninsula as, as uh, one of those per, per century that, uh, that occurred. So you can end up with these, um, these really, really intense volcanic eruptions um, that are really influential uh, to local climate on the island and in other places in, in the world. I wanted to talk to you about, um, about three of my very favorite volcanoes on the island of Iceland. But before I do, um, there's something that you should know. And that is that volcanoes on the island of Iceland are always given female names. And they're given female names for obvious reasons, because they're beautiful, they're complex, and they have the ability to change the world around them. You can quote me on that, thank you. <laughs> so the first volcano, this is truly my favorite volcano. This is called Hecla. And Hecla translates to the queen because it kind of looks like she's wearing a crown. Um, and I just love going to Hecla because it's in the Eastern volcanic zone as are the other two. 
Um, but it's kind of hard to get to. So it's, it's a volcano that's off of the ring road. So people that are going to visit her usually have an intention, right? So they're usually a geologist or they're usually um, really interested in doing some pretty um, hard backpacking. So I've been able to meet some really interesting people um, when I have visited Hecla just because she's uh, a little bit of road, remote and off of the, off the ring road there. Um, Hecla also has a really interesting volcanic history. So when we talk about um, volcanoes, uh, we can talk in terms of recurrence interval. Um, we usually call that repose though, when we're talking in terms of volcanic activity. So uh, the repose of Hecla is, um, we see that she has erupted 18 times since the Viking settlement of 874 CE. So I can just kind of imagine the Vikings showing up, they've got their farmstead next to Hecla, then she erupts and they're like, damn, now we gotta dig out the volcanic ash, they get it all settled, and now there's another volcanic eruption. So she was quite a nuisance, but she's also been really active in modern time. So Hecla erupted in 1970, in 1980, in 1990, 2000, now she's been dormant for the past 22 years. And that's a big question mark for um, the geologists and volcanologists because we're not sure why she went into a phase of dormancy after being um, active every 10 years. And truly, if you're living at the, at the base or within the shadows of Hecla, just as you see this farmhouse here in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, if you're living next to Hecla, you really want that repose to be more often because you want that volcanic activity to be kind of like clockwork as she was, but um, you don't want her to store energy because anytime you store energy, you end up with more, uh, more energy that's being released and more explosive eruptions. So it's still a big question as to her dormancy phase and we wait for her to erupt next. Our second volcano is called Katla. Uh, Katla is uh, much older than Hecla. So Katla originates at about 10,000 BCE. And from looking at the Tefra chronology record, we find that she's had 300 subglacial eruptions. Um, also a nuisance to the Vikings, uh, erupting more than 20 times since 874 CE. Um, I'm gonna come back to, to Katla. So we're gonna talk about her after we talk about her neighboring volcano. So 25 miles to the east of Katla is this volcano, and you might be familiar with her. Thank you, Google. Um, I'm gonna to refer to her as Aya. Um, I'm not gonna try that 13 letter name. Um, so Aya, uh, also in the Eastern Volcanic Zone, you might be familiar with her because the last time she erupted was in March 20th of 2010, so 12 years ago, um, producing a, a 13 mile tall ash cloud, uh, ash cloud blowing to and towards Europe. So when Aya erupted for three days, the air flights were grounded. So they grounded about 10,000 flights that affected about 10 million passengers and cost approximately $50 billion in gross domestic product. So the explosion of AIA um, really um, alerted us to the importance of understanding volcanoes and, and, um, and volcanic warnings and pre-planning. Now, we go back to the story of Catla. So what I told you is that Catla is about 25 miles to the west of Aya. Um, Katla has its own magma chamber. Aya has its own magma chamber. However, they're connected by a magma chamber that's lateral in the subsurface. So when we look at the Tefra chronology record, what we find is that when Aya erupts, Katla also soon erupts. And when Katla erupts, 
it triggers Aya to erupt. So you're imagining kind of like this bathtub effect of, of magma in the, in the subsurface. So what we said was uh, Aya erupted in 2010. Katla has been dormant since 1918. Can you do the math? Katla has been dormant since 1918. So for more than 100 years, this volcano in the Eastern Volcanic Zone has been dormant. Um, so when you talk to any geologist or volcanologist on Iceland, or really like in the Global Watch program, Katla is, is on high alert. Um, and they're, they're watching uh, the presence and activity of that magma chamber. They're watching her as she inflates or, or deflates. So a lot of attention is, um, is looking at Katla. Probably when she erupts, um, if you're trying to get to Europe, you might just take a boat because I don't know how long air traffic might be grounded. It should be a much more significant event than Aya. Um, some predict that um, the eruption could be three times that of an atomic bomb. So a lot of stored image energy within that underground space. So we talked about tectonics and we talked about volcanoes and that leaves us with a little bit about glaciers. So this is one of my very favorite pictures that I have ever taken in Iceland. Um, uh, when we talk about the ice sheet uh, in Iceland, uh, the ice sheet is referred to as Vattenjökull. The term uh, Jökull refers to a glacier. So anytime you see that um, on a map of Iceland, you know you're talking about a glacier, some type of a glacier feature. So the ice sheet is referred to as, as Vattenjökull. And the first expanse of that ice sheet happened about 2.7 million years ago. And it uh, grew all the way up into the last glacial maximum approximately 26,000 years ago to cover the island in its entirety. And, um, and we know that from a lot of like offshore moraine deposits that we can, can take a look at. And thanks to like some of the offshore drilling programs um, collected information on that. Um, so since 26,000 years ago, the ice sheet wax and wanes. Um, at modern day, the ice sheet covers approximately 14% of the island. It's about 5,000 square miles in size. Um, Vant and Jokul refers to the ice sheet itself, but it has 30 different outlet glaciers. So when we're thinking in terms of, of glaciers and glacial activity, we need to remember that these are dynamic systems. They're moving from high elevation to low elevation, from high gradient to, to low gradient, from high slope to low slope. And as they do that, they have this a, a huge amount of erosive ca uh, capacity. So they're eroding that ba basement rock that's underneath them to create valleys. So in this picture, this panoramic picture up to the left is a major part of the ice sheet. Uh, to the right is the, um, is the North Atlantic. So this was taken along the Southern coast uh, at uh, Iceland's second national park called Skatafell National Park. Um, I love this picture too, because um, you're along the, um, along the U-shaped valley, you're seeing these beautiful lateral moraines. So these deposits of, of sediment that have been carved and incorporated within the body of that glacier. You'll remember that in geology, what we like to say is that the present is a key to the past and the past is a key to the present. So when and uh, if this uh, outlet glacier completely melts, um, we'll be left with her story. So we'll have an understanding of the glacial transport and the mechanisms that form that valley long after that ice has melted. Here's a, a fantastic drone image coming up the, the bottom of that glacier and going up to the top of the outlet. And I show you just this just to give you a perspective of the size and the scope of this ice and the, the maj majesty and the energy that these glacial features have. You can see some fantastic crevasses. Um, truly, probably when I went to Iceland for the first time in, in 2006, um, I had never seen a glacier before. And I thought that glaciers were going to be completely pristine. I thought they would be just kind of completely white. And although, you know, you, you, you studied it, you've looked at diagrams, you know, you have this idea of, 
uh, of uh, glacial moraines and terminal moraines. And it didn't really hit me until, um, until I saw this uh, firsthand up close and, and personal. And in addition, we said that Iceland has 33 active volcanoes. So all that volcanic ash gets incorporated into the, into the ice sheet too. So it kind of just makes for different perspectives and um, a different uh, sort of landscape um, that you might see in other places that don't have volcanic activity. Um, so the other uh, interesting thing about that and Jokul that is that this ice sheet that's approximately 3,000 feet thick at modern day covers four volcanoes. So there's four volcanoes that are hidden by about 3,000 feet of ice. So even if you fly over the top of Van Jokul, you can't see the summit of these volcanoes because they're buried. So your question might be, Dr. Joe, what happens when you have a volcanic event underneath an ice sheet? And the answer is a catastrophic event. And those catastrophic events are called? Everybody, that's an easy one. Yoko Lake. Um, so uh, a Yoko Lake is an Icelandic word um, for a flooding event. So these volcanoes that are underneath the glacial ice, they still have a vent, right? And so that vent is going to act as a basin. So as magma comes up the throat of that volcano, it's giving off heat. It's melting the basement of that ice and it's catching in the vent of the volcano. So that vent will eventually fill up with water. And then once it is completely full, it will breach. And so water will go down quickly down the flanks of, um, of the volcano in a catastrophic flooding type of event. It's called a, uh, it's called a yoko loop. So the, so the good news is for those four volcanoes, um, they're monitored by the Icelandic Meteorological Society, and they have a really good handle um, using imagery about the size and shape and depth and volume of those vents. So if you, if you know the volume of those vents and you're measuring the rate at which the, the, the ice is melting and, you're, and, you're, and filling up that, that vent, then you can make some predictions about when you think a flooding event is going to occur. And then you can, you can make warnings and, and move ahead with evacuations. And that's exactly what they did at Grimsvatten, also in the Eastern Volcanic Zone in 1996. So Icelandic Meteorological Society realized, oh, that, that vent is almost completely full. They issued an evacuation warning and sure enough, there was a, a flooding event. Um, the flooding event produced a discharge of 180,000 cubic um, feet per second of water flowing off the flanks of that volcano. It had enough energy to take out a steel bridge. And so that's what you're seeing over here to the, to the right. Um, it's a, a monument that they have in place commemorating that 1996 flooding event. Um, the glacier I just showed you, the cross section, is right there in the background. So that's Scatafell National Park. These are, again, along the southern coast. Um, so, so the monitoring system works. No lives were lost. Um, but remember, there's only one road that goes around the island. And so it took them about three months to rebuild the bridge. And like, kind of like it is what it is. So they just um, organized kind of like a ferry system to, um, to get across these areas where the bridge was in need of replace, probably for about three months. So, but wait, there's more. Remember Katla? She's back. So Katla is one of these volcanoes that's underneath the ice sheet. So Katla at modern day is capped with about 2000 feet of glacial ice sitting on top of her. You see this diagram over here to the right. There's Katla's central vent. This is a, a lobe of uh, Vatten Jokul. So, Katla has had significant flooding events because she's had significant uh, um, volcanic events uh, during her modern historic time. 
So I want to call your attention to this slide where you have these different colors and those different colors represent different pathways of flooding events. So um, looking at terpochronology, we understand this. Looking at um, fluvial sedimentology, we understand, we understand this. So um, the event in red represents um, going all the way back to 1612. But I want to call your attention to um, the flow pattern that's highlighted in yellow because that represents a Catla flooding event that is, it has its own term. It's called a Catla loop, and it's considered to be um, one of the largest mega flooding events ever in the world, documented. And this uh, flow pattern highlighted here in yellow represents a flood that took place in 1755. And it is estimated that the discharge of this flooding event was 1 million cubic feet per second of water flowing off the flanks of, of Catla into the North Atlantic Ocean. And that's the discharge that's equivalent to the Amazon River. So um, these joke loops, um, they can do either in Iceland at least, can do one or two, one of two things. They can either be really erosive or they can be really depositional. The 1755 event was really depositional and it's thought to have extended the coastline for about two miles. So completely altering, altering the area um, for which the historic settlers were, were living. A cataloupe. So I don't wanna leave you with death and destruction, because that's not my style, clearly. Um, so I wanna leave you with something that's happy. And if we wanna talk about happiness in Iceland, we talk about going to the Blue Lagoon. So I'm sure your grandmother has probably been to the Blue Lagoon. Your friends have been to the Blue Lagoon. Kim Kardashian has been to the Blue Lagoon. And you too can go to the Blue Lagoon for about $70 and soak all day in geothermal wastewater. It doesn't sound so glamorous when we put it that way, but whoever came up with the marketing strategy for Blue Lagoon, we need to hire them. So how this works is um, the Blue Lagoon is on the Rainies Peninsula, and the Rainies Peninsula is about two hours south of the capital city of Reykjavik. So if you visit Reykjavik, you can very easily, there's lots of buses that can take you there, even if you're there for a day. So, um, so um, Rainey's Peninsula is in close enough proximity to Reykjavik that they wanted to, to use the subsurface water that's geothermally heated for energy. But it's heated super critically. It's, it's so hot in temperature that it has to be cooled before it can be transported to Reykjavik for use. So that's the first catch of using a retention pond. The second part of the equation is that uh, the Rainey's Peninsula has uh, a really high felsic mineralogy. So remember when we talk about felsic, we say it has silica that's greater than 50% content. And so silica that's in the water has to be pulled out of that system before the water can be transported because it's corrosive and because it pr precipitates, it clogs pipes. So even if you look at this picture of the Blue Lagoon, you can see it on the, the edge in the lower right-hand corner, you can see where the silica has begun to precipitate. And that's what gives the Blue Lagoon that milky blue color is the, uh, the amount of silica that's suspended in, in the water. Um, so if you're at the Blue Lagoon, these beautiful Icelandic women are gonna come along with these vats of silica <laughs> and they're gonna encourage you to put it on your face. They're gonna tell you it's the fountain of youth and you're gonna do it and you're gonna take your picture and then you're gonna to go to the store and you're gonna buy the silica that's really expensive and give it to your wife and she's not gonna be happy because it's called the fountain of youth. So don't do that, Never mind. Don't buy it, don't give it to your wife. Um, so the Blue Lagoon um, is essentially a retention pond. But one of my favorite things about Iceland is that they are trying to harness natural energies. Um, Iceland is 100% sustainable on renewables. Um, the population of Iceland is only 300,000, 
Um, 200,000 of their Icelandic people live in the city of Reykjavik, so the capital city. So they're sustaining themselves mostly on geothermal. Um, and then the remainder 100,000 people that are living in and around the island is using hydroelectricity. And we're talking like small scale hydroelectricity. We're not talking like Hoover Dam style electricity. So um, um, Icelanders are very conscious of their environment. They respect their environment and they really work to preserve their environment. Um, and even in the use of these like very small scale uh, hydroelectric dams. Even sometimes small houses or even like small hostels will have their own hydroelectricity for which they um, they generate energy. And of course, there's hydroelectricity because you're catching the meltwater off of those glaciers. Um, they've had to expand their grid um, really in the past 10 years because of tourism. So uh, people like us who want to go and visit the island, are, we're putting stress on the system, especially in May, June, July, and August, like the, the big tourist months where the, the sun's out and the water's, the weather's a little bit better. So they've, um, they've worked to expand um, the grid, but again, they're doing that sustainably. So I am gonna leave you with that. Um, I am happy to answer any questions, comments, or short stories. Um, here's a picture of my book if you haven't had it yet. Um, you can buy it at Wiley, you can buy it on amazon.com. That a picture on the cover should look familiar. So that's uh, Aya's eruption from 2010. It was taken by uh, my colleague, Sigurd Stevenson. Um, need to thank my wonderful husband, um, students at Barry, faculty at Nebraska, and of course my publisher, Wiley. And if you would love to go to Iceland, I would love to have you along. So uh, my husband and I have a tour company. It's called Adventure Geology Tours. Um, we, we take trips to Iceland, but we're also offering trips to Costa Rica and the Arctic Circle. Um, but for AIPG's 60th anniversary, we are sponsoring two different trips. Uh, the first trip is July 6th through the 18th, it's 13 days. Second trip is July 25th through August 6th. And um, like I said, I've been going to Iceland since 2006. So uh, almost two decades. Um, and I, I just love the place and I love the people. Um, and there's the only thing I can guarantee about going on a trip with me is that it's guaranteed to rain probably at least one day and you're guaranteed to have a great time. So um, my contact information is up there. If you um, if you have any questions, and I can send you a brochure, or you can go to the website. So I, I'm happy to answer some questions. Question. Sure. Um, I went to a talk on our local geology club last about a year ago. They had gone to Iceland and came back and had rocks, including a rhyolite. So my question is. How in the hell do you make a rhyolite at a spreading center with basaltic crust? And you talk about felsic tufts. So <laughs> same question. How do you Good. how do you do that Good. in a geologic and, and, uh, setting? Yeah, and that um, that question is still up for debate. So um, okay, so a, a couple there's 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 three different ideas. Um, the first idea is Remember how I showed you that very first slide where the mantle plume originates 50 million years ago and it's under Greenland? It's thought that maybe that that hot spot when it was under Greenland picked up some of the felsic continental crust and it's just kind of like recirculating it through. Um, the second idea has to do with um, fractionation crystallization. So the idea that um, if you have a magma chamber erupt for long enough, all the mafic material is going to expand itself, expound itself, and all you're going to be left with is felsic material. The third idea, and this is this is new, so this was um, just published by um, Jillian Folger in uh, 2021. She's been doing a lot of research leading up to it, but this is kind of like her big um, paper that was in uh, Nature. Her idea is that maybe we have the, um, the plate tectonics and the Pangaea outlined wrong in the north. 
So she's thinking that there might have been what she calls Icelandia, like um, a piece of like a microcontinent that was um, a remnant of that last <clears throat> Pangaea cycle. And it is that remnant, that microcontinent that is feeding the hot spot. So, so, and, and that um, lots of people are still kind of disputing that. It's kind of like a hot button topic. Um, but those are kind of the, the leading ideas of where, right, where is that felsic material coming from exactly? But you, so what we know is that you see a lot of explosive eruptions, but for sure you do see, um, you do see uh, basaltic eruptions. And in a place like, um, like Hecla, for example, um, her eruptive history is always above 54% silica. So she's always, 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 always been really high in, um, in felsic content. Um, but then you can look at um, some of these other volcanoes to the north and they're always basaltic. And even the, the last eruption that just happened, the picture of it, it's a, it's a fissure eruption on the Rades Peninsula. It's all basaltic. So, I, so it's, it's a lot of fun to think about. I, I don't exactly know what answer is correct. So this is the eruption in August. There's it at nighttime. Stunning. Other questions? Martin, did you have a question? Yes. Okay. Oh, can't hear you now. Yeah, you're you're muted there, Martin. Okay. CO2. Uh, many extensional regimes of this type have lots of CO2, and it is some cases a danger to the tourists. Um, the locals know about it. Um, do you have you measured the CO2 coming off of these uh, geothermal uh, waters and also the uh, amount coming out of the volcanic gases? Um, no, I sure haven't. Um, but you're right. They, um, the Icelandic Meteorological Society does monitor for that. But I can tell you, um, when we hiked to this last volcanic event that you're seeing on the screen, um, my, my husband and I, were, were, we were probably already there for about four hours. And I'm like, gosh, Joey, I'm getting sleepy. And I kind of recognized that we were probably getting like carbon monoxide poison because we were so close. <laughs> and so we, we, got, we got the hell out of there and we climbed up the valley and then we instantly felt better. Um, but, you're, but you're right, it's something that um, is monitored. I have done, so I'm classically trained as a hydrologist and, I, and I've done a lot of water quality sampling in and around Iceland, but I've never tested for, um, for carbon dioxide and I don't do a whole lot with um, the geothermal springs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another comment is uh, Air Iceland, if you fly to Europe, uh, you can make an arrangement where you have a three day layover in Iceland. Yes. And that's a fun way to get there. And uh, my family did touring then in three days, you get to see a lot. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of nice because um, you know, it, like the what we call like the golden the golden triangle is really close. So you could leave um, really on a, a day trip, and you could get to see um, waterfalls, Thingvellir, and um, and geyser. And then, of course, you could go to the Blue Lagoon if you wanted to go to the Blue Lagoon. Um, and if you if you had a, a, probably an extra day, you could go to Skatafeld National Park, where the glaciers are. Do a uh, I'm a geologist, and I made a. Uh pilgrimage to the original named erupting fountain, Geyser. Geyser. <laughs> Fun. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Tammy, we have in the um, chat box, Tom Green asks, is there a way to somewhat predict volcanic activity? Um, well, um, 
So recurrence intervals are nice. So I, you know, I think they thought they had a really good handle on um, on Hecla because she was going off like clockwork every ten years. Um, but especially like at um, at and it. At like Catlet, so Catlet is a hundred years dormant, so they're expecting her to erupt any time now. But um, what they do, um, and this is all out of the Iceland Meteorological S uh, Society, so that's kind of like their, um, you know, their their um, their governing geology as association, like we would have, like GSA or uh, AGU. That's kind of the their umbrella uh, organization for for monitoring. Um, they. Um, put sensors in and uh, around. So they're looking for um, uh, different transfers of heat. So they're looking to see like how quickly that magma is moving closer to the surface, you know, kind of like moving up the throat of those volcanoes. And they're also looking for inflation. I think that's uh, one of the, 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 the big giveaways is when the vol volcano starts to kind of like expand and bulge, just like we saw with uh, Mount St. Helens eruption. So they mon monitor those with these like tiltometers. And you know, um, uh, GPS technology and satellite imagery has been become so good that I, that they use that too, getting those aerial views. In terms of um, the volcanoes that are underneath the ice sheet, what um, so like I said, like you can't, you know, you fly over the ice sheet, you can't see the top of the volcano. But usually, right before there's um, an eruption, that magma has. Um, is coming up so quickly from through the through that volcano that it's melting the water on top of that of the glacier that's sitting on top of it so quickly that you end up with a depression. So, like if you fly over, you can start to see a depression form where the the, the cone of that volcano is, and that's a, a pretty good indicator of um, of an event that's going to happen. So, so anytime that they begin to see that, they usually in, initiate initial evacuations. I think that those volcanoes underneath the ice sheet are harder to um, to harder to, to monitor because you've got so much ice uh, sitting on top of it. So, looking for like bulging, you know, sides and stuff like that. That's not really realistic, and I, I'm not even sure if you could. Um, monitor transfer of heat up the throat of that volcano, unless you did some pretty extensive, um, you know, coring to get to the to get to the flanks. Great question. Well, if we don't have any other questions. I'd really like to thank you, uh, Dr. Giovanelli, for your time and effort on our behalf to present such a wonderful overview of uh, the volcanoes and other um, wonderful parts of Iceland's geology. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more uh, interest in uh, the, the uh, tours that are being offered as part of the 60th anniversary for AIPG, and I really thank you for that as well. You're welcome. And I'll be um, at GSA. We'll have a booth. Um, so stop by and say hi. It's called Adventure, Adventure Geology Tours or Iceland Geology Tours. So you can find us there. All right. That's great. Well, thank you. Good. I got to go pack now. <laughs> All right. Leaving tomorrow. That's awesome. <laughs> thank right. you, Tammy. Bye, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you very thank much. You. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Recording stopped.